We got it. Well, got it. Driver, roll down the driver window. Driver, with your left hand, open the door from the outside. Detectives uh, calling one of uh, okay. Wisconsin's guys to see where they want it, and how they want to work with it. Yeah, well, they, it's 23. What's that? They just sent. They're going to send me, I guess, the captain was somebody in Wisconsin. It's 23. Yeah, okay. I don't know what they want to do. Yeah, they're they're going to have to make the call. We're going to have to hook okay. on the car, take it to the jail. That way, if they want to process right. through, it can be. All right. And then detain yeah. these guys yeah. and they go up there. Just take them up there. Okay. All right. A young girl murders her father. She claims she was sexually abused. I felt that I had to defend myself. But the prosecutor doesn't buy it. She had conspired with other people to try to kill her father. I wasn't lying. I was telling the truth. Her punishment? Life in prison. It's a severe sentence and she deserves every bit of it. Yet some feel the case calls for leniency. I think the governor's going to feel that way too. For me, I think it's important to point out that even though I suffered horrific abuse, that's not what pushed me to my breaking point. What actually pushed me to my breaking point was the rape of my little sister. And once my little sister was raped, then I broke and you know, crossed that line. That's when I actually committed the homicide. The abuse to me probably could have continued without pushing me to that point, but knowing that I failed to protect her, um, created anger, devastation, desperation that caused me to cross that line. When you see what happens to you happen to someone else, it multiplies in your own mind and then you've got all this defensiveness that you want to protect this other person because you love them and you care for them and you don't really know another way to stop someone who's so much more powerful and bigger and stronger than you are and so you react out of fear.
the physical the physical physical is much more um, horrific but the mental plays into it because when a person mentally abuses you it's it makes you feel like you're less than and so where you would maybe confront them one-on-one -on -one, the mental abuse reduces you in a way that you feel insignificant and that you don't feel as if you can stand against that person so it's extremely powerful and um, a lot of times even though like you might not be suffering the physical abuse witnessing it for someone else you feel it just as much as they do Angela McCowan. And where do you live? Trent, North Dakota. Who was your best friend? Angela Collier. And Angela Collier was married to? Thomas Ayers. Uh, he seemed like a really nice guy. He was nice to my face, but behind closed doors he was totally different. How do you know? And you would say that he hit her. He hit her in the stomach, in the arm. Jager by her hair. How often did she tell you that happened? Multiple times. How soon after they met? Within weeks. What did you tell her? To leave. What did she say? She wouldn't. Why not? She liked him. Did you ever see any physical evidence of how he treated her? Seen bruises. Did she tell you they were from him? Yep. Were they bad bruises? Very dark. Where? On her arms, her legs. <laughs> He'd get mad if she didn't clean the house just the way he wanted it. Yeah. Or half supper ready when he got home. She'd have to leave the bathroom door open and she had to go to the bathroom. Why is that? So she knew that she wasn't texting or talking to anybody else. The only time I could see her is when he was, wasn't was home. He didn't want anybody else in the house. Do you know why? Because he didn't want her to have any friends. Why? He couldn't control her. After she moved to Colorado, I never heard from her until she moved back. How long a period of time was that? A couple of years. Well, what'd you think of that? Her. I hated not hearing from her. Because I didn't know what was going on. Why do you think she stopped contacting you? Because of Tom. Why would a man not want his wife to contact his best friend?
Because he's the bad guy. What did you think when you heard they were getting married? I knew it was a bad idea. Was there a ceremony? No. Where were they when they got married? Colorado. They went to the judge. How did you learn of the marriage? Like after she come back, he didn't like Zach. I think that's why Angie ended up giving him up. It's because of Tom. Why didn't Angie work to keep Zach in the house? She probably thought it was safer. For what? For Zach not to be there. Safer for Zach. He grabbed Storm by the arm. I've seen that many times. And just pull her. How old was she? She was just little, little. Angie would go up there to watch the kids while he'd be at work. And then she'd stay up there. Where? Up in Botnell. Because he wouldn't let ha Angie have any custody of him. Was there a court order? They were supposed to have shared custody. What? Did he, did he comply with that order? No. He wanted control over everything. Did you learn about a Jennifer coming into the picture? Yeah, he met her online. Who? Jennifer. And what ha What do you know about that as it relates to Angie, your best friend? Not long after she, uh, after they got married, Angie couldn't see the kids anymore. Why not? Because he wanted them to be a family, and he didn't want Angie in the picture. Did he continue a relationship with Angie? He would come down here, and he would sleep with her, and he would give her money. You heard about what happened in this case. What was your reaction? I was happy. You are happy about what? That he was gone. Why? He couldn't hurt anybody else. His girls would have had a really difficult life if he would have lived. Because they probably would have went through the exact same thing Angie did. Tom would have had complete, total control over him. At least now they have a chance to live. What he did to Angie, not letting him see not letting her see her, her own kids, beating her. Even after, even when she was pregnant, he would kick her stomach. Why she was pregnant? How do you know this? She told me. I think Ashley probably felt cornered. In a way. How so? probably felt she was losing her mom. Her mom was just sticking up for her with, when it came to Tom. When I first met him, I didn't like him. He didn't, he just said hi to me and I straight up didn't like him. Uh, he could be good sometimes, but other times he was an asshole. So. I never really seen him do anything to my mom. But I watched him beat my little brother. <laughs> my little sister was six months old and when she would cry, she he would lock her in a room. When she would, when she was potty training, and she'd pee the bed or wet her pants, he would dump water on her. He's bitten her before. 
I've seen him treat Veronica not the way she should be treated because she is different in his eyes. <clears throat> he wasn't really, he was really mentally abusive to me. He didn't really, he never touched me. He wouldn't dare. He never did. But there was little things like he wouldn't let me, I was kicked out of their house. I had to go and sneak over when he was at work. He dumped all my stuff out on the lawn and made my mom, my stepmom, come and pick it up. Mm. He just, he was an asshole. The first time that I met him, we had supper and we were in the kitchen. We were either done with supper or it was right before we ate. And I told my mom that I don't like him and I hope you're not going to get serious with him. She told me no, he was just a friend. What did you hear about what he did to your mom? Who told you? <clears throat> did you say he didn't I mean, see? when a two-year-old chokes out a one-year-old or a three-year-old, you gotta wonder where it comes from. I've seen bruises on her. I never seen, I've never really seen her, him lay her hand on her. I did, however, see him hit my little brother multiple occasions. How? I don't really remember the other two times. I just remember two times, oh, one time. Storm was out sleeping in the living room. We were living, it's called it was called Shots Trailer Park in Williston. And uh, Storm was crying. And I went over to my little brother's room and I asked him, will you, why don't we go out to the living room and just watch some TV and put Storm in her swing so she'll stop crying. And he's like, no, I don't want to. And I was like, no, it'll be okay. I promise that nothing's gonna happen to you. They're sleeping right now, it's fine. And he's like, okay. And I was like, the TV will be down really low. We won't. And I don't know how long we were out there for. I don't think that long. And we had a curtain hanging up because there was a hallway with all the rooms and then there's the living room. We had a curtain hanging up against the hall so you couldn't see back there. And all of a sudden the, the curtain ripped open and they had a, it was like one of those like L-shaped counters and they had a bed like laying against it. And I ran behind the bed and I thought Zach was behind me, but Tom grabbed him in the back, by the back of the head and just threw him off the couch and started beating him on the way down. Um, yelling at us, telling us that we needed to get our asses to sleep and he, we that we better be ready in the fucking morning because we're going fishing. See, the, the treatment didn't really get bad until after they moved to Colorado and then when my little brother got put in foster care there and then my mom and Tom moved up here. Well, Tom went up to jail up here. I think it was in Dickinson. And my mom followed and she was pregnant with Veronica at the time. And then Zach went to foster care in, I think it's called Beach, North Dakota. For the longest time, if he said jump, she said how high. I was, her kids are her, her, her life. And he got her to move to Colorado and he never let her talk to me. I didn't hear from her for five years and the first time I ever heard from her was in a letter. Did you try to reach her? How? I didn't know how. I was, I, I don't even know how old I was. I was young, I didn't have the resources. For the longest time she was scared of Tom and I don't blame her. I really don't. Um, I mean, I've heard stories of how he was. And then she was, when she was, this was her plan, when she got my brother back, she was gonna start fighting for the girls. Before Tom came, we had a really strong relationship. I never wanted to leave. <laughs> they would have to force me into the vehicle when my dad would come and pick me up, or when Jenny, my stepmom, would come and pick me up. But I never wanted to, I, I loved it there. I had my little brother there. I love my mom. Don't get me wrong, I love my stepmom and my dad too. 
but I hardly ever got to see her, and when I did, it was it was nice. <clears throat> and it was a very close-knit family. Very close. And then it started to where I wasn't allowed over there anymore. I still remember to this day the phone call I got. I don't remember when it was, but when she told me that they were moving to Colorado. I begged and pleaded and I told her I didn't want her to go. I just didn't have a good feeling about it. I don't remember how long after that she left, but never heard from her again until five years later. How was your relationship then? I was ecstatic that my mom was back, but I was afraid to get close to her again. Why? I didn't want Tom to come in again. I didn't want her to leave me. So I kept her at an arm's length. You can't, you can't talk to him about Tom. He freezes. He hates him. Um, at my mom's funeral, he just, Tom was there and he froze. He was shaking. Tom couldn't do anything to them there, but he still, he reverted back to that little boy that got beat all the time. Finally, he was like, I just want him dead. What did he say to that? I think that was at my mom's funeral. How old was Zach then? He was 18, he was 16, 16 or 15. When I first heard about it, I was working at Applebee's and my aunt called me and she's like, um, you need to ask them if you can leave. And I was like, oh my God, what's going on? The last time this happened, my, I got a phone call. My mom was getting life flighted to Minot. What is, what is going on? So I walked out and my auntie Tana was walking towards me crying. So I started crying. I was like, what's, what's going on? And she's like, Tom's dead. And I was like, I was taken aback and I was like, who's Tom? And she's like, Thomas Ayers. And I was like, what about the girls? I didn't care about how he died. I didn't care about any of that. I was more worried about the girls. This is going <laughs> to sound really bad, but karma. She deserves, she deserves some punishment. I mean, but I feel so bad for her. I know what he could have put her through. I know what kind of man he was. And everybody, everybody that met him thinks, thought that he was a great guy. But until you live with him, until you had to be around him, don't tell me that he was a great guy. Don't tell me any of that. I understand, I, I feel bad for Ashley. I do. I feel horrible for her. I understand why she did what she did. I do. <laughs> yes, there could have been an easier way out. There could have been, but my thought process is, is when you're, when you back a scared animal into the corner, they're going to attack. Mother. From what I was told, Ashley was put through the ringer with her mom and her boyfriends. I mean, I don't think she was, I know she wasn't planning on killing either Tom or Jennifer, but you can only take so much. And when you've lived that life of boyfriend after boyfriend, shitty boyfriend after boyfriend with your mom, it takes a toll on you. Um, me and my ex-husband were together at the time, and him and Tom met working on the rigs in Williston. He was a lonely guy. My sister was lonely. I brought her out to the house. We had dinner with him, and the next day he moved in with her. And when did they get married? How much longer? Uh, maybe six months. I think Elizabeth was maybe eight, Zach was six, and Storm was maybe a year old. How was he about the family contacting Angie during those first six months? He wouldn't let us talk to her. 
Wouldn't let you talk to who? Ange. Right away? Yeah, he started right away. What was that all about? Um, I remember one day he, my dad called Angela and just wanted to talk to her and he, Tom answered the phone. He wouldn't let him talk to her, told him to leave her the F alone. That same day, my dad tried, I went over because we lived across, we lived in an apartment complex. She lived across the driveway. I went over there and I told him to never talk to my dad like that again. And after that, I was not allowed in the house. What did he say to you? He didn't say it to me. He told Angie to tell me that I wasn't allowed over there. Mentally abused her. Um, as far as I know, I know he tried to choke her. I don't know if he hit her for sure because she wasn't allowed to talk to us. How do you know these things? Uh, between uh, Elizabeth and Zach. What would they say? That Tom was very mean to her, their mom and to them and to Storm. Did, did they tell you, Elizabeth and Zach, how he was mentally abusive or mean? Uh, anytime Angie would want to go anywhere, she'd have to wait until Tom got home so he could take her. Um, that meant even to the grocery store to check the mail. Uh, within the next day that he moved in, they moved out of that apartment in like two weeks so that she wasn't around me. Uh, he held, uh, the kids, he always held the power of the kids over her. If she wanted to go anywhere, he'd always tell, him, tell her she'd, he'd take off with the kids and she'd never see him again. He'd always threaten her if, if she ever left him that she, he would um, take the kids and she would never find him. Um, he's slapped her, he's pushed her. Um, he's a real piece of work. He had a hold on her and I don't know why. Even he moved up to Botno and when they filed for divorce, somehow he got custody of the girls. I never understood how he got custody of the two little girls. And he would always ask Angie to come up there and watch him while he was working, which, you know, was no big deal. But when he'd get her up there, he wouldn't let her leave. You know, he'd always threaten her and he always had the neighbors watching her as well. It was a very weird situation. He was a very manip manipulative person. I would say she had PTSD. She was a battered wife. She just wanted to be with her kids and he held that over her. Uh, he had a lot of power over Ange. I don't know why, but he did. But didn't she try to get away from him? Yes, but he stopped her every time. Stopped her every time from what? Leaving. When she was in Dove Creek, um, she went to social services and they bought her a bus ticket and he found out and he threatened to kill her. Why did she go to social services? Because he was beating her. He, uh, he was at the funeral of my sister and he brought the girls to, to the funeral and he was scared of, because he treated all of us like crap. He put my dad and my sister in jail for uh, harassment over a phone call. So when he came to the funeral, he was actually scared of my entire family because everybody wanted to kill him. The way he treated the kids, my sister. But we wanted to make sure the girls got to say goodbye to their mom, so we all agreed not to. We didn't talk to him. We just let him sit there. And he left, actually left the funeral after it was over and left the girls at my sister's house, Montana's house, for about an hour, and then he came and picked them up. We never heard from him again. He deserved everything he got. Why? Because he was a jerk. He was very, he was a hateful person. Um, it was almost like a relief. He tormented my family for, up until he, Angie died actually, because then he had no control over anybody, over any of us. Very hateful. And I was so glad when my sister got away from him and finally came back. And I think she was too. It's too bad that she couldn't have seen this. You know, she would have had a rough road with them girls, but I think she could have done it. I wish, I really wish she could have seen it. Seen what? This case, this Tom getting shot. You wish your sister could see that? I do. Why? Because I think she would have jumped for joy. Why? Because he would have been done. She, he would have been out of her life. 
she would have got her kids back and she'd have been the happiest woman in the world because he would have no control over her. None. I'm Jerry Rabbi. Um, I live in Hayes. I came up here in 2005 and uh, came up here and didn't have a whole lot of stuff at all. I uh, lost everything in the Hurricane Katrina and from New Orleans. And, and uh, Jennifer offered me a place to stay and a place to restart, I guess, you know. We, we knew each other from childhood and uh, whatnot. Um, Dated off and on, and had occurrences. You know, mm -hmm. as young people, we had uh, been uh, dated off and on. You know, uh, and so we knew we were familiar with each other. What do you know about Jennifer's parents? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Evil. Who was evil? Both of them. Both who? The mother and the father. Are just totally evil. How so, Jerry? They they don't have feelings for children. They should have never had kids. They don't. They should never. You know, the father raping the daughter Jennifer, not good. The mother allowing it, turning her back, not acting like a mother, a protective person. That not good. How do you? It was more than once. It was more, probably more than a thousand times. I don't know. How do you know this, Jerry? I've, I've seen it firsthand. I mean, a lot of people in Western Kansas was subjected to stuff like that uh, in the seventies because of him. Um, you know, because he, you know, did it outside or whatnot. I guess get away from his wife or I don't know. You. you did you ever observe the sexual abuse of Jennifer? I've, yeah, I've seen it. What did you see? His name is Dennis, the father, right? Mm -hmm. What did you see Dennis do? Mm -hmm. uh, just a whole unspeakable act, you know, everything. Why didn't you stop it? Mm, I did, sometimes. <laughs> what did he say? Mm -hmm. I don't know, it depends on what time I did it. <laughs> Can you tell us what you saw Dennis do to Jennifer? Mm, rape. What specific, Jerry? Detail. Oh, intercourse, oral, vaginal, um, just with the child and then in ways that <laughs> just unspeakable shit with children. And, uh, just, uh, full intercourse, I guess, you know, very out in public? Huh? Yeah. Like where in a where in public? Country, you know, country roads, circus, uh, you know, uh, basketball game, mm, just anywhere really, anywhere that crazy dude wanted to rape his daughter at, I guess, or be seen doing it. You know, he loved the public attention. <coughs> And uh, trying to be in the spotlight, his dirty deeds and all that, because he could, you know, hurry up, just, just, and get out of there before he get caught, you know. And that's the way he, he was. Mm, it wasn't good, not all the time. Uh, we both had problems and issues that uh, that affected us, and it made a daily. A daily life a little bit harder than most people's, you know, dealing with family and family issues and maybe drug and alcohol issues, you know, that didn't make us, it kind of made us a different people. Yeah, they, there was a little bit of fighting. Uh, they, they weren't li literally physical. Um, they were just lots of yelling, you know. Um, a lot of bark, no bite, you know. There's, I'd rather be heard. It was, you know, just noisy. Did she ever assault you, Jennifer? No. No. Did you ever assault her? 
Mm, possibly, yeah. Possibly what? Yes. Yes, what? I'm feeling, you know, I, I cussed her out, and you know, like I said, uh, I got a domestic battery, hit her once. How many times did you hit her over the time you lived with her? Mm. I have never counted. I know that this one time I got charged. I know it was one time. And maybe another time before that. You know. That what? That she got hit, man. You know. Um, I've been told that um, that night Ashley got hit. That our last argument. I don't remember that because when I'm mad, I don't remember very much. I'm just maybe I didn't think about it or whatnot. And they say I hit her. I didn't hit her, but I might have been forceful with her, and I might be, you know, that I might have done, you know. She, uh, I think she suffered a lot of, you know, from her parents breaking up, divorce, and, and getting stuck in that, I know. It, it can be hard for kids, you know. I think that really had an impact on her. Good or bad impact? Bad, bad. I heard her conversations about this, that, you know, and she didn't seem too happy about their home and her, you know, their lifestyle and trying to get in and used to them or their transition into a new life or whatnot. She was stuck in the middle of, you know, of, you know, domestic type of arguments or uh, disagreements. And I'm sure it did affect her quite a bit. I've been told, yeah, that she, she felt uncomfortable and you know, Jennifer told me that she used to hide under the bridge over by where we lived. You know, she didn't want to hear me yelling. And, and like I said, I'm pretty, I'm pretty vocal. I yell a lot. You know, last night we did together. Yeah, it got physical. And she seen that, yes. Can you explain the time when Ashley ever got burned with a cigarette? Can you explain that? Yeah. Um, we were, And when we were out, you know, in the field <laughs> doing typical stuff, <laughs> and uh, well, I won't really mention that because it's really not important. But we, when we got ready to leave, um, Ashley stole the front seat of the car, you know. <laughs> Me and my buddy, you know, it's us, you know. Uh, now we got tag along here, and um, I grabbed her. I was smoking a cigarette. I lit a cigarette. And I, was, I was being hard, and I was like, uh, "You can't run up there." <laughs> and I'm forced her out of the. I was gonna pull her out of the seat, and just pulled her out of her clothes, you know, from <laughs> clothes. You know, you took her clothes off? No, she. I was pulling her out of the car. What happened? And her pants came down. What? Her pants came down and exposing herself, and, and she got burnt. With a cigarette? On accident, yeah. Where? On her face. It was not bad. Was, yeah. Were you guys drunk? Mm, I can't recall if we were drinking or not. I don't think so. Sexual? Absolutely not. Jennifer was not a good mother. <laughs> I hate to say it, but she, she was not a good mother. Why do you say that? She, a lot of her stuff that happened to her would come back and, and she would do the same thing to her daughter, but not sexually, as far as I know. What do you mean by that, Jerry? Um, she, uh, it's like there's verbal torture, and, and there's a lot of that. She tortured her daughter and telling her she was going to kill her all the time. 
And it was one of her ways of punishing her. And I've never seen I've never seen her get hit, but but she would always tell her daughter that you know you ain't worth shit or something. And I'm gonna kill you. Like when the first time I heard her say that she was gonna kill her daughter, and she and she said basically that you're gonna get along with him, ready, you like it or not. And if not, I'll kill you. You know. And I imagine she'd said that more than once because. It looked like, you know, it was a very quiet routine, but it's just too quiet, you know, to be punishing the kid. Hmm, I gotta go check that out, you know. <laughs> What's this technique, you know? Thought maybe sitting in a chair or whatever, but, you know, she was holding her down on the bed and, and kind of being in her collar, maybe, and uh, saying it, that she was gonna kill her. Not good. Yes? Was your trailer, private trailer, your <laughs> three, a safe environment? For a child. Mm, no, I, I, I'm like I'm a really yell. You know, I, if I don't get my way, I'm a big kid, and then I, I'll let you know by screaming, yelling, and acting a fool. And like I said, it, in my rage, of, I, you know, hurt you know, hurt a mother, and, and evidently they. So I, I grabbed her on the arm and, and hurt her as well. So that's not good. And, and children shouldn't see that. I felt guilty. My own guilt that, you know, all this took place, you know. I think everybody is affected different, but, you know, I feel, you know, responsible in a way too, you know. And for just my bad behavior when I was there, setting wrong examples, I don't know. Teaching the wrong things, guns. Uh, that type of stuff, you know. I ain't my kid. I should never been doing, you know, handling guns or, you know, plus I'm a convicted felon. <laughs> nah. She's seen a life that she probably shouldn't have. And it's not her fault. It's a combination of her mother, me, you know. We're responsible people. It's easy to blame somebody's, you know, incarcerated, or you know, blame for something. But you got to look at the deeper details. Of what made her do this? You know, and I, I don't. You know, it don't make me happy what she did, but I can see why it happened. I can see it. I think she needs help. She needs more help than. <clears throat> As a person that's been locked up, it doesn't make you better. It, it doesn't, you know. If you're going to get help, it's going to have to come through rehabilitation, and that, they claim they do that, but penitentiaries don't really do that. They don't focus in on mental health care and things that she would need focus on, you know. Oh, you know, a person's, they do a crime, I guess, you know, they deserve some kind of punishment. Mm, I just, I think that truly, you know, I love Jennifer, but it's hard for me to say, but she asked for a lot of it herself, you know. And why? <laughs> she was a victim of serial child abuse, you know. And it messed her mind up enough to affect her daughter because she took it the way she was treated and put it back out there like that. Because I, I did, I remember hearing that her dad used to threaten to kill her. And so that's why now her cycle was to threaten to kill her daughter all the time. And that's not right. You pull the dog's tail so many times, it's going to bite. I believe it's generational. Generational. I think that something has to occur to make it stop. Like just watching the abuse from my mother's side. I mean, I don't know about her parents. Her father sexually abused her and her sister. His son, my uncle, sexually abused his daughter and his granddaughter. He had recently been charged with that. Thank goodness, you know, finally it's coming to an end. Um, 
but there has it has to stop somewhere and in my family my father didn't have any brothers or sisters and my sister's not abusive towards her children lots of therapy <laughs>
Kansas. I know Ashley because she lived in Gorm and she played with my daughter, Belia Klein. I thought Ashley was a very sweet, nice girl. Um, she, I thought she was kind of quiet. Did you see any temper problems or any anger problems at that point in time? No, no, I, I never seen Ashley get mad. Did Ashley ever talk to you about her father? Um, actually, Ashley didn't talk to me about her father. Belia would come to me and talk to me about what Ashley had told her Which because was it, was, it was very upsetting for her. What was it? She said that Ashley's father would hit her and um, yell at her and stuff like that. She seemed like she'd missed us a lot, but she was different because her hair was darker and she, she was wearing like darker type clothing than what she used to wear. And the more Ashley came over, the more it seemed like she wasn't chipper anymore. She just, she was really down and really depressed. I mean, she still called me mom and stuff like that. And, and she, as much as possible, she would rather hang there at the house than go any, any other place. When I first heard about it, I thought that there's just no way. It floored me. I did not think there was any way that Ashley could do anything like that. There was just no way. What? Because I never really seen Ashley get angry or upset or anything like that right there. I mean, yes, she was sad, but it was a sadness like, um, I don't know, like you would cry on your bed or something. It wasn't something where you would like go out and kill somebody. I thought that there was, there was stuff going on that pushed her into it, that made her feel like her only escape and her only way out was to take drastic measures. Her way out of what? Um, I don't know, maybe some type of abuse or being mistreated. I don't think that she should get the full term that they're, they're calling for. There's just no way. She, she, this is not Ashley. This is not something that, this is not something that Ashley could have done without being pushed into it. I just don't, I don't think so. Well, I'm Selena. Um, I live in Hayes, Kansas. I go to Hayes High School. How do you know Ashley Martinson? I know Ashley by school. What school? Um, Hayes High School. And how long did you know her? Um, for a good six, five, six, seven months. It was in the year 2013, I believe. We spent like every second together. Not every second, but because of classes. But like outside of school, she would come over a lot. We would go to the library. We would just like hang out and stuff, like watch videos. So you spent a lot of time with her? Yeah. Um, what did you think of her? I thought she was a really cool person. Why? I don't know, she just seemed, we just got along. Her and her dad didn't really have a good relationship and he would always, her and her dad w were yelling, but I don't remember what it was about. I never thought she had this in her. Hi, my name is Kaylee. I'm 25. And where do you live? Here in Hayes, Kansas, sorry. <laughs> and how do you know Ashley Martinson? Uh, she's my daughter's friend. We, she went to school here in Hayes didn't really talk about her mom. She kind of skirted around the issue of if it was ever talked about. 
Did that, cons did that make you wonder? A bit. Um, it made me worry about how they were as, you know, family in a sense, how close they were, if they were close at all. I have not met Jeremy Martinson personally, but there were some things that Ashley has said that, you know, she, they just didn't get along and it seemed more like he just didn't have an interest in her. Oh man, I loved when Ashley came over. She was, she was just so funny and she was so nice. She's always had scars or cuts on her arm. Did they look like they were recent? Some of them were scabs, but not like bloody, like they were healing. I knew like she was, there was just something that was either angering her or it was just so sad to her that she just couldn't control it and had to do something about it. And that just happened to be what she did. She was always happy, but you know there was something under the surface. I couldn't believe it. I was in shock for a good two days. Didn't really want it to be her. Why? Why did you have that emotion? Because I like, I thought of her as another daughter. She was really sweet all the time. Wish I could have seen her more. Why? It would have been nice for her to get away from it all and be with people that actually loved her because I feel that my family loved her as if she was our family. So. So then you moved to Rhino and Dallas Thompson. Okay, so when did you move to Rhino? Uh, almost a year ago. It'll be, it'll be a year, I think, June. Okay, so probably June of 2014? This is when you moved to? Okay. I don't know a whole lot. I don't know your family. I don't know who to call. I don't know who the uncles are, the grandma, you know, all that stuff, so. We lost contact with everyone. What is it like living in that house? Some days were good. It was better when he was at work. Because he still worked in North Dakota on the oil fields for a, for a while. All right. And my mom didn't get along very well. When you're talking him, you're talking about Thomas? Yes. And your mom is Jennifer? Yes. Okay. So it was better when he was working on the oil fields. So, so, then what? What do you mean? Well, what, what was it like? When he was gone, it was a lot better. He wasn't good to my mom. He always hit her. Threatened to kill her. He didn't like Veronica very much either. He always would choke her out. He what? He would choke her out. Choke Veronica out? What does that mean? Hold her up by her neck and choke her out until she passed out. Okay. And then a, well, a month or two ago, he gave her a black eye. Okay. And you say he used to beat your mom? Yes. How can you describe that? He would push her around, smack her, choke her. At one point he held a gun to her head. So then we, you know, back to the guns. Are, there's a lots of guns in the house. Where are they kept? I mean, I know where they, I know where some of them were, but where are they kept? Oh. I don't know, he, he kind of puts them all around the house, sometimes in the living room, dining room, cabin, his room. Uh, there is a gun safe. It's just, um, pretty much everywhere throughout the house. Are those guns loaded? I have no idea. Well, some of them aren't. <laughs> Why are they loaded? What is your dad thinking? I don't know. I don't know what he thinks comes to that. Well, I mean, is he afraid of somebody? Or what? Why is it? 
Why are there loaded guns in the house? <laughs> it was even supposed to have guns. I, I didn't hear you. <laughs> he wasn't even supposed to have guns. Oh, he wasn't supposed to have guns? Okay. <laughs> Why not? Because he got arrested for assault against one of his ex-wives. Oh. Did you like Thomas? He was in his good moods, yes. How much of the time was he in his good moods? Differed. I said him and my mom did not get along very well. Sometimes you just get pissed off for no reason and you go off on her. Or sometimes I get along with no other. It's different every day. So what kinds of things would you do when you get pissed off? I just break stuff, hit her, yell, scream, threaten, kill her. What can you tell me about the holding her gun to a head? What, what can you tell me about that? I didn't actually see it. I was just in my room. I heard them yelling and fighting about it. No reason I knew for sure. But because my mom told me the next day about it. She always came to me to talk about it. She had no one else to talk to. She said he was an abusive asshole half the time. An abusive asshole? Yeah. So you and Thomas were close, right? It was the closest thing I had to a dad. Okay. You, you talked about Thomas pretending to rape your mom. Was that in front of you? He did it in front of me and in the girls. And the other girls too. It was, I, I guess I don't know. When you say pretending, like how f far pretending? her down, he'd spread her legs and just look like he was whooping her. Sometimes he'd tell her she's gonna die. Sometimes he'd just tell her I'm gonna be like your dad. I'm just like your dad. He'd get her to the point where she was in tears. Do you think your mom and him were good together? No. Not at all. She told me that she was trying to find a way out. Yeah, she's tired of him doing that to her. That's why she just got more, she just got two new jobs. She wanted to save up money and leave. He didn't know about it. How much money did she save up? She just started, she didn't save much money at all. She just started her jobs. Okay. Um, I'd like to figure out, you know, as far as your sisters, you know, who to talk to. okay? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I mean, physically, they're fine. Is there anything you would like me to pass on to your sister? Sister, how are you raising me one? Well, I don't know which one. It, it, it seems to me, but from talking to them, it, it seems to me <coughs> that uh, Letitia really seems to be in charge. Absolutely. Sisters. We can make sure they're going to go to a good place. I, I know that people that make those decisions would make sure. I don't really know what a good place is. Veronica? You can tell me about her. Is she special ed? Yes. Okay. What? Where? Where is she deficient? Where is she? Is she slow? Is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. In what part? Sometimes speech or misunderstanding and stuff, and she's kind of forgetful. Okay. Was Thomas good to the sisters? Only one of them. He favored the taste the most. That was his first daughter. And his head wasn't really good. It's Veronica. I don't know why. He was mean to her. 
physically, mentally. We had fun of her a lot. She was different. And I'm a police officer here at the sheriff's office. And so I just wondered if we could just talk for a little bit. Is that okay? So how do um, how did Ashley get along with with your dad? My dad he let her to uh, so use free book and and then she got along then she got along with dad and just do what and do what you that's ah, was helping down and uh, and he and he and and then she was happy. Ashley was helping dad and then she was happy? Yep. Did you have any pets? What what kind of pets did you have? Diesel and buddy. But Buddy died because of my dad, and Diesel is is with my neighbor. Well, tell me all about Buddy dying. How did that happen? Um, he, he was not listening. Oh, and so what happened? Tell me all about that. So my dad throws him around and and probably shot him. How do you know that? That's because he told me. He told you what? That he did that. So whose puppy was Diesel? Was was that your whose dog was that? Um, someone else's. Did someone else's? And whose dog was Buddy? It was not. Well, it was in the pet. Door. Oh, was in the pet store? Yeah. So you went to the pet store and you got yeah. Diesel and Buddy. Oh, my dad did. Your dad, and he brought them home? Yeah. My dad said Buddy is his. Oh, okay. Did your dad like Buddy? Hmm? Did your dad like Buddy? No. No? You didn't think so? Because he didn't listen. So did your dad ever get mad at Buddy? And what did he do? Shot him. He shot him. And That's when I was up there and what Jesus was there. You weren't, you guys weren't there though? Yeah, when that happened. Oh, okay. Were you sad that happened? Yeah. I said, I told me we only have one dog. And then that said, I threw him around and I just killed him. He said he threw him around and killed him? Yeah. Oh, okay. Dad grabbed the dog and put it where he put his flare and he said it. Was this your dog or somebody else's dog? Oh, no, the dog. Oh, okay. And that's how mad he is. Did you ever have any of your friends come over to your house and play? No. No? How come? Because my dad said no friends coming over. What happens if you don't do what it says? What happens if you break the rules? And we get a timeout. And how? What happens when you have a timeout? We get a spanking or we stand up right on our tiptoes like this. Oh, you have to stand in the corner with your on your tippy toes. Or get spanked. Okay. And and who would give you a spanking? My dad, but my mom. At, when it was like dinner or supper time, my mom told me to stand up by the wall and she spanked me. And she spanked you? What did she spank you with? A belt. A belt? What What did the belt look like? It was my dad's and it was brown. It was brown. Amanda got lots of spankings. Amanda did? Uh -oh. What did Amanda get spankings for? We're seeing the stuff that she's not supposed to. Well, what is what's she not supposed to do? It be on the dock or 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 do all this 
the vet's not supposed to. Did you say be on the dog? Is that what you said she did wrong is to be on the dog? Would that be she'd be like climbing on the dog or something? So that would, she would get a spanking for that? Mm -hmm. Who would do that? My dad. Your dad? Did she cry? And she just screamed and then stop. And then she'd stop, okay. Yep. What else would she do that would get her, that she might get a spanking for? I forgot the rest. You forgot the rest? But she got more spankings than you? I know she too. She got more than both of you together? Yeah. So, did Leticia get spankings? Yeah. Who would give Leticia spankings? My dad mostly. Your dad mostly? So, did you ever cry when you were at home? What what? I don't know. Did you ever cry at your house? Yeah. What? Not a lot. Not a lot? What did you cry about? That. I get spanked a lot. Then you get spanking. The rules on the side of your refrigerator, those were made by your mom. Oh. And, but sometimes your dad would spank you too about the rules? Yeah, we break the rules. Okay. Or we lie. Or you lie. Okay. Okay. Because I'll find to my dad and he spanked me with a belt. Okay, so your dad spanked you with the belt if you told a lie? Yeah. Yeah? Like you. If he says that, do you sit by the Leticia? And I said, yes. And, I, I, and then I finally said no. Okay, so then you got a spanking? Is that what you said? Um, yeah. Yeah? When he spanked you, did he ever spank? Was it hard or soft? Hard. So did anything ever happen where you got some kind of like a mark on you from something your dad did? Yeah. What was it? Oh God! Were you ever scared of your dad? Yeah. Yeah. How come? Ah, uh, because he always gives me spankings. He always gave you spankings. When he's mad. This what he just he grabs a gun and he just the and he grabs the dog. That's how mad he gets. He grabbed the dog. When he gets mad, he grabs the dog. Oh, so first he shoots up in the air, and then 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 he grabs the dog from that. Um, those are our neighbor, but so he shoots up in the air outside. Yeah. Oh, not in the house, though. Oh. Okay. So, let's talk about your mom and dad. How how was that? How did your mom and how were your mom and dad before everything happened? Can you tell me how your dad and your mom got along? Did they did they ever fight? Or did they get along they well? They sometimes fight some, and there's some Kind of get along. And sometimes get along. Did you ever see your dad do anything mean to your mom that made you unhappy? What did you see? Wait. No. No. You never saw your, your dad do anything mean to your mom? Yeah. What? My mom would see him um, on the couch and my dad was doing this. What 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 was happening when he did that? Mm. Um. I think he was doing it hard or soft because my mom's head was not red. Your mom's what? Head was not red. Your mom's head was not red. It red. Head is red. Yes. Right. Yes. So he was grabbing her around the throat with his hand? No, he was like this. Like, like that? Okay. Had he ever done that to anybody else? Yeah, to me and Leticia. So did he do that one time or more than one time? 
Orba was a tie. Oh, okay. Do you know that my parents are watching me? Is who told you that? Uh, I'll say. Is that why? Is that why you're nervous to tell me things? Because your parents are watching you. Do you have any pets? Yeah, Buddy and Diesel. Okay, and German what? Shepherds. German Shepherds. And how old were they? Uh, they just got born. Like when I first got them, they were just born two weeks ago. No, one week ago. So how long did you have them? Only a couple days. Buddy and Dad killed my dad. Shot him. Uh, Diesel's with my neighbor. How do you know that Buddy's dead? Because my dad told me that he shot him. And he fed him to a bear. Why would he do that? He wouldn't listen and I told him, put him in the shelter and you're maybe not just teaching him, right? And he's like, well, if I give him to someone else, they're just going to shoot him. Would you rather me shoot him or them shoot him? And I'm like, none. He was teaching him wrong, probably. He was like that way when we first found him. He was like a scared dog. He was mean to my to the dog bunny. What did he do to the dog buddy? Choked him on the couch and the dog started uh, making a choking sound and he threw him against the wall and then he threw him in outside because he got mad at him that he, uh, he was not listening. And he also went under the porch, and my dad threatened me that he said he was going to shoot him at night. And he shot it up, shot a bullet up in the air and pretended like he shot him. And he, then I'm like, Daddy, I don't like you. And then he's like, you don't like me? I mean, you don't want me. You get your coat on and get your boots on and leave this house. He told me to live somewhere else. So he, the reason why he said that it was because he wanted me to see that he didn't really kill him. When I walked out of that door, I started crying, and I just ignored the dog. So you saw him choke the dog? Yeah. And, you and, it, and it really almost made me cry, and I ran up in my room. And so, and you saw him throw the dog up against the wall? And I heard him, and I saw him. You saw him actually do that? Yeah. What and did I, the dog do? It started yelping, and mm. it, it was scared of my dad. What wall did he throw it up against? The outside one. And oh. then he then he threw him to the couch, and then he grabbed him by the neck, put him on the couch, and started choking him. And what was he saying? He said he said bad words and saying, you stupid guy, don't listen to me, this is what happens. So I was at your house one time, and I saw these rules on the side of your refrigerator. Yeah, one was for Ashley and one was for all the kids. Did your mom and dad ever get mad at Ashley? A lot. That's how my dad and my mom died, I think. So, did they ever say that they were unhappy with Ashley? Mm-hmm. They did say that a lot when they were mad at him. Mad at her. You have to behave to my dad or he will spank you really hard. He spanks hard. He spanks hard? Okay. So wh when he spanked you, what did he spank you with? A belt. A belt, okay. He wraps it up this thick. Oh. And then he spanked you three times, is that what you said? Mm-hmm. Okay. So you and Veronica got a spanking? Mm-hmm. And we started, we started screaming and crying. And then what happened? And then my dad said, you want another one? And we're like, no, no, no. And he did it anyways. So were you scared of your dad? He is mean. He choked me and Veronica once. One time he came in from work and I was only a little big. I was a little girl and I punched him in the ear on accident because I didn't know what I was doing. Punched him. He act he grabbed my neck. He, didn't, he wasn't noticing that he was doing this because he was so tired. He choked me and I started turning different colors. Right now I'd not be here if he actually killed me and I never realized it. And then he realized that he was doing this to me and picked me up and started saying, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. And 
Did you and did you say you saw him do that to Veronica too? Yeah, he sort of like he was grabbing Veronica's hair like this, and then Veronica started kicking him, and so that made my dad mad. And Veronica and uh, my dad peed on his chair and choked her, and she was trying to run, and she started and she was standing up on the chair and she hooked her back to the chair, and the chair was flipped. So did he, was that while you were and living here? And he yeah, and he threw her to the ground and started smacking her across the face. What was that before? Why did he do that? Because Veronica started kicking him and he got really mad. And then he it's like, Veronica go go wash up, and changed into his, his, her pajamas and he went with her. And so I'm sorry, I just got really mad at you for doing that. Never do that again. So did he ever choke anything else, or anybody else? Well, I think he choked my mom. So how did your mom and dad get along? They really ever got along. It was, they always fought a lot. And What did they fight about? Do you know? They were fighting over a lot of things. Did you ever see your dad hurt your mom? Mm-hmm, sometimes. What would he do? Uh, hit her. Well, sometimes he would smack her across the face or hold her down. Yeah. So she did not like to play like that, but that's how he played. Mm-hmm. He plays rough, and I did not like. And every time my dad uh, was holding her down and my mom was screaming uh, and said, stop, stop, stop. So my dad, um, he when he let go, uh, um, my mom went by me and just gave me a dirty look. She does this every time my dad does something mean to her. So I don't know why she gives me a dirty look. It just makes me really upset why she would do that. I I mean I didn't do anything. But she gives you a dirty look. Mhm. Mm so what kind of mean things did your dad do to your mom? <coughs> Sometimes he would smash her, and he would boss her around a lot. Did you see that? Yeah. How about Amanda? Has Amanda ever been spanked? Uh, yeah, she was the mo most one that got spanked. So who would spank Amanda? My dad. He would spank her really hard. What did he spank her with? His hand. His hand? Okay. Um, and what did he spank you guys with? A belt in his hand. A belt in it. Did Veronica ever have a mark on her neck? No, it was just a, like a big red mark, and then I went away. Well, where did it come from? My dad. What happened? Remember the choking thing? Something did she ever have a black eye? Veronica? How'd she get a black eye? Uh, I think my dad punched her in the eye, and then she got a black eye. How do you, Why did he punch her in the eye? Ah, I forgot. But I know she had a black eye before. And so, what did she do about that? Did she go to school with the black guy? Mm -hmm. and what did she tell everybody? Uh, she didn't tell anyone anything because my dad would get really mad at her. Oh, he would? Mm -hmm. Did he tell you not to say anything? or? Yeah, don't say anything. Don't say anything about what? About the black guy. Did you hear him say that? Mm -hmm. He even told it to me. What did he say? He said, don't tell anybody that I punched her in the eye. Did you guys ever have friends come stay over at the house? My dad didn't know about that. How come? And he also didn't allow any boys there. And one time my dad saw that a boy was there, a teenage boy that my big sister had him at the house to, and he got in trouble. And my dad said, get the age out of here. Do you know who that was? Mm-mm. No. He was just a stranger I didn't know. But I actually knew him. He was fat too and pretty tall. So no dad says nobody can come over to the house. Mm-hmm. How come? I don't, I don't know why he said that. You don't know why he said that? Did you ever want to bring somebody over to the house? Uh, I actually wanted to go some, to somebody's house, but he didn't allow that. Oh, he didn't allow that either? Mm-mm. Oh, yeah, we got also, uh, the, for Christmas, we got those Hulk hands, mm -hmm. and they're like the little, when you put your hands in, there's like the thing so you can kind of hold on to it, and it showed a fist, 
Or um, my dad would punch hard with it, and I'd try to block him, but he keeps punching me, and I said, I quit, and he's like, get your butt over here, now, you're fighting with me, now, and I'm like, dad, I don't want to, and he's like, do it, I'm going to give you a spank, and I did it. So can you think of a thing that your mom did that was bad to your dad? Hmm. Hmm. Not listening to him. She was so he's the boss of the house when he comes home. He's the number one boss. Who? How? Do, how do you know that? Because my dad. That's what my mom told me, and my dad told me that he's the number one boss. Mhm. Mm so you have to do what he says. Mhm. Mm okay. And so, what happens if you don't do what he says? Does you spank him, or you have to stand in the corner for uh, like ten, five minutes? You just have on to your tippy toes. On your tippy toes, that's hard. Put your hands behind your back and your face into the car. And what happens if you don't do it? You usually get a hard thing into it. And Amanda, she had to do it too. Every time she did not stand on her tippy toes, my dad would grab her by the hair and start pulling her up. And then she would stand on her tippy toes. He would grab her by the hair to get her to stand up? Mm -hmm. Do you think she knew how to do that? <laughs> no, poor little girl, huh? She was only one, too. Oh. Uh, Me and I don't do it. So what's an, what would happen if your mom didn't listen to your dad? He'd usually like, smack her across the face or something. Right in front of you? Sometimes, but not all the time. Okay. I'm Renee Crochelle, and I own a horse boarding facility. I guess they just being a foster parent, you know, and I got two kids of my own. March. March 8th. Of last year. Until when? Until August 8th, actually. Okay. When they when they originally first came, um, and Oneida County had taken pictures of any markings and and all that, um, that we had noticed that <clears throat> um, Amanda's bottom was red. Um, the girls had bruises here and there. Leticia had said that. Her dad would spank Amanda until she if she would cry herself to sleep. And when Amanda was hard, very hard little girl to get to sleep, and um, when she told me, she says, "Just spank her, just spank her, spank her, spank her until she cries herself to sleep," because that's what my dad does. And I said, "No, that's not going to happen." And um, I said, "No, we're not, we're not going to do that." So that was, wow. I was like, wow. You know, um, and then um, how Leticia had said that Veronica got upset at had a temper tantrum, or she, they, her and her dad got Thomas had uh, had a quarrel, and she started crying, and Thomas had told her to shut up and slapped her, and then she cried more, and then she he had grabbed her hair, and um, the temper tantrum continued. And then he slugged her, and that was from Leticia. And Leticia also had said that there was one point that Thomas used to tickle Leticia. And I said, what do you mean, tickle you? And she had said, well, the one time I was on, I was on the bed, and he had a hold of my arms above my head, and he was tickling me, and I didn't like it. So I spit in his face, and then he slapped me. And I just went, okay. And I said, well, we're not going to do any, any of that. But Veronica would tell stories about how um, Thomas would hit um, and spank the girls, and vice versa. Leticia would say how he would spank the girls, especially Amanda. Did they talk about the, the, the force used and how it was? That, yeah, um, that they had get hit by with a belt um, and the hand. Um, a lot of slaps across the face. Um, so, I mean, both girls, um, you know, some of the stories that I've told was, was pretty heartbreaking. So... Did they say what would motivate dad to do this? They blamed it on themselves, saying that they were bad kids. 
That they did wrong. Did they say it happened a lot? Yeah. They talked about um, the dog. That was heartbreaking. What did they tell you? Um, that they had Diesel and and Diesel's brother, and that um, the other the other puppy didn't behave, <clears throat> and um, that Leticia told me the story, and she had said that he took the dog out, and Leticia begged not to take the dog outside because he says I'm going to go kill it. And she's like, take it to the pound, give it away, give it to a friend, give, do anything, but don't kill it. But he's like, a dog like this doesn't deserve to live. And he went out and shot it. And had no remorse and came back and just told the girls, he's gone. It was just really odd how they would talk about their dad. Um... In, in the aspect of they didn't talk a lot about their father. They didn't talk a lot about the mother either. Um, they didn't talk about like mom made this or, you know, cooking or this was mom's favorite flower, you know, and most, a lot of kids do. They'd say, you know, my dad did this with us or my mom took us there. They didn't talk a lot about their parents at all. Um, just once in a while would blurt out something like my dad wore a lot of t-shirts. The kids talk about their parents and, and what my boys do for me and, and, you know, my mom takes me camping, we go horseback riding, we go fishing and, you know, we go to the zoo and, you know, and, and then they tell stories about their experiences and they tell their friends and, you know, my mom makes the best spaghetti and she puts meatballs in it, but it was never a explanation of things. It was always just a, a one, just out of the blue, just my dad wore white t-shirts you know it was just really weird stuff that um i just i i didn't hear a lot of stories of you know my mom and me gardened or we did this together or, you know there you know my mom used to read to me before we went to bed there was never any any stories like that from the kids in the springtime when we planted my garden and we're planting some flowers um, I asked the girls to help me and stuff and um, I showed them how to plant flowers and vegetables and things and they really got a kick out of that and they really enjoyed that and, and they said my mom didn't do this you know so I said well now you know how to and now you know, now you know how to do it you know so they really like that um, so yeah different things like that you know if it was to me if it was a happy home they'd, they'd be constantly saying you know I helped mom cook or you know I did this and we went for a walk or I didn't hear any of that the only thing that I heard Leticia say is that once in a while her dad took her out hunting and they got to shoot guns um, but that's you know that's about all I, I heard you know, I never heard dad did this with me or dad did that with me or um, mom did this with me or mom built this or, you know, were they in any sports? No, they wanted to be in sports. They wanted to be in soccer and things like that. They were very excited about maybe doing that. Leticia said that her mom didn't do much that Leticia had um, took care of her. And um, I said, well, here you don't have to. And I, and you could see it right away that it immediately, like the first week, it was like Leticia kept trying to jump in and, you know, as soon as Man Amanda would fall down or she would, you know, get into toys that she wasn't supposed to and she'd be, no, 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 no. And she, and she'd slap her hand and, and, you know, and spank her butt. And I'm like, you are not, don't do that, please. I said, you're not the mother, you're her sister. You don't have to do this. Just be her big sister. And she's like, well, my mom didn't do any of that. I took care of her. So I said, well, that's, it's not your responsibility to take care of her. You're just supposed to be your big sister and love her. I think Amanda was just lost. You know, she should have just been a typical two-year-old going on to three. And I think Amanda's mind, she was a very smart little girl. And I think she was set back emotionally because she didn't have the love. 
I think, you know, the cuddling and the, you know, you're my baby type of thing and really cuddling with her. Um, I think there was a lot of that missing. I think that's where I think they got very, we're on our own type of thing, you know. It's me and you, kid, you know, and that's how Leticia took care of Amanda and Veronica was like, you're my big sister and we're all going to watch out for ourselves. And that's the feeling I got from them when they came is that they they pretty much watched out for themselves. When they first came, um, I also had another foster boy here and Leticia was very mad at my oldest son who at the time was 11 and uh, jumped on his back and put him in a chokehold and he couldn't get her off. And um, the other foster boy ended up pushing both of them over at the same time and and uh, to, to break up the, the hold. And, and um, Martin had asked Leticia, why did you do that to me? And she's like, I was trying to kill you. Why did Leticia try to choke out and kill your son? Anger. I don't know how the whole thing started, but Martin tried to walk away. And when he walked away from the situation, Leticia jumped on his back. I was inside the house and when my son came in he was absolutely beat red and he was crying and I said what the heck happened to you and Mikey came running in and he's like mom you know and and Mikey came in and, and he says Leticia had him and she had him like this and she knew exactly um I actually learned learned um that Leticia did had talked about um that Thomas a couple times had had chokehold the girls. Um, Veronica had some temper tantrums. Um, she'd all of a sudden just yell, you know, get mad at things. She she liked to yell. <laughs> Did their attitude or anger dissipate over time? Yes. Mm -hmm. Substantially. Oh yeah. Were they different kids from when you got them? Oh yeah. What do you attribute that to? doing things with them, paying attention to them, um, their schoolwork when they come home, helping them with their schoolwork and reading to them, reading the stories to them and playing games with them and um, uh, going for bike rides and um, we went camping and um, fishing and just doing things with them, horseback riding, um, letting, letting them be kids. Well, when the f girls first came, the very first night, Leticia sat up in bed and she cried. And I gave her a big hug and I said, it'll be all right. Um, Veronica never cried once. It wasn't really talked about. I mean, they didn't really talk about... A couple times they talked about the scene, you know, and what was in the house. And, that, and just that one night crying, you know, and she only cried for maybe 10 minutes, if that. And that was it. I, I felt that she was afraid of Thomas, that if she would step up to the plate and she would try to be a, you know, say, okay, girls, we're gonna do this or that, that if she would get in trouble by Thomas and then get hit. What made you come to that conclusion? Because he hit the girls. And, and the girls had said that um, she had hit the mom, that, they, that he had hit the mom. At that point, my opinion on the whole thing is, you know, from the girls being in the house, um, my my personal thing at that point would say, I think Ashley just snapped. How long did she put up with this is the question. How, how long can somebody take till they just say, I just can't take it anymore and they just snap. You know, they just like, I, I'm not going to deal with this anymore. You know, and you wonder what goes through her head at that point. And I always wondered that is, you know, did she just tell herself, I'm not, I'm not going to let what happened to me happen to the girls. And my opinion, I think, I think that's part of how I foresee it is she snapped to the point where if he's going to do it to me she, and he's doing it to Jennifer, he's going to do it to the girls. And from what they told me already, from the stories that they told me about with the hands up and the spitting and punching Veronica and that it was already started. 
and I think it would have just progressed. And I and you you wonder what went through Ashley's mind at that point where I'm just not going to do this anymore. I'm not going to take it anymore and and to stop it. I think I think Ashley was mad at her for letting the father do to just because the girls had said that the mother would never step in when he would hit the girls. She would never stop. She would never say stop it. She she would never jump in to to stop him from hitting. She would stand there and watch. And I think she was just as afraid of him because she knew she would get beat if she tried to stop it. So I think Jennifer was very afraid of Tom. And I think Ashley got mad but shouldn't have taken it out on Jennifer. I don't I don't think so. But there again, Jennifer should have called out for help. She should have, you know, said, Hey, I got an abusive husband. You know, I, I need help. You know, he's he's hitting my kids, he's hitting me, you know, verbally, physically. But you hear from other abuse cases that you get to that point where you're so afraid. You are so afraid to call out for help because they threaten you and say, you ever ask for help or you ever do this and I'll kill you. So you don't know what Tom had said to her or why she always stood on the sidelines and watched and let it happen. Why did she? Why didn't she step in? Why didn't she say, stop hitting my child? Why? And I think Ashley got mad at that and said, you're just as much to blame. And I think that's why she did it. That's my personal thing is because she's like, you know what? If you don't have the guts to stand up and protect your own children. Ashley has taken Leticia and Veronica's father away. And I, I feel horrible for that. I mean, that, those, those are the only parents that those two girls knew. But they don't have to deal with what he, they, that he put them through anymore. And they might not realize that right now. And they probably maybe never will. But they went through hell and back, especially those two girls. You know, after, um, I'm 43 years old now, and I know that people can change because I've changed. And my deepest regret is that my father will never have the ability to change, and that was because of my choices. On the other hand, I have two nieces who are now nine years old and four years old, and I thank God that they will never know the pain that my sister and I have felt. I was already planning on leaving. <laughs> Since I just turned 17, I already had some money saved up. My mom wanted me out. My stepdad wanted me to stay. They <laughs> were fighting about me. <laughs> and then she grabbed the knife that was on the shelf and she came after me with it. That's how I got <laughs> and I tried to take it from her. And I sliced my hand on the knife and I finally caught it. <laughs> and I stabbed her with it because we were trying to get the knife from me again. Okay. And how did you stab her? I don't know what you mean. Where did you stab her? I don't know. I just started stabbing and fighting with my life. <laughs> I was so scared. Okay. Do you know, have any idea how, how uh, you know, where on her body you stabbed her? <laughs> no. Okay. Do you know anything like how you were holding the knife? I mean, if, if, let's say this pen, I mean, if this is the handle and this is the point, just like the point, can you, can you show me how you held the knife? Like what position? Because there's a lot of different ways. Okay, 
like that. So it was more, it, it was like this, not like this. Because it, it tells a little bit about people. Okay. Um, so it looks like you got cut tw three times, twice? Three. Okay. And okay. How many times do you think your mom got cut? <laughs> if you had to guess. I don't know. You don't know. Okay. But something happened there to make you so mad that you stabbed her a lot. <laughs> what? You stabbed her a lot. <laughs> and some of the stab wounds are after she was dead. So you know what that tells me? That tells me somebody is really hurt and really looking to try to figure out why am I being blamed for this. And really mad that she had to go and get it to this point. Where was the last place you ever stabbed her? I don't remember. I really don't remember. When you and your mom were fighting? What was being said? It's my fault. What do you mean it's your fault? All of it was happening, it's, she just said it was my fault. Uh, okay, and cleaning up is more than just cleaning you up. Sometimes it's cleaning up <clears throat> the house. I can tell you, when, I, when, when my wife is leaving, she vacuums. So what did you do to clean up the house before you left? I didn't. You didn't do anything? Okay, well, you talked about giving the kids food and drink. Okay, what else did you do to prepare the house after the struggle and before you left? Nothing. Where's the knife? I think it's in the bathroom. I didn't want the girls to see. I, I used a phone charger no, and tied up the door so they couldn't get out. So I, didn't, I didn't want them to see. <laughs> it didn't feel real. It didn't then or it doesn't now? <laughs> then it didn't. It didn't seem real? Okay. <laughs> I felt like I was in a daze. Alright. <laughs> I was in a day to sleep. It's like trying to remember a dream that you had. Okay. I mean, did it feel like... Did your body feel different than normal? What did it feel like? It's a dream. You weren't mad at her? I was feeling, I was feeling really emotional. It just all came out. What all came out? Emotions. What emotion? Pain, anger, sadness. I don't know if it's, it's just rage. I mean, you can go from from sorrow to anger real fast, and the lo the line between love and hate is that close. There's no way anybody would look at this and say this was something that was planned. This is fucked up. It's chaotic. If there is a plan, 
It wouldn't have happened like this. I think at times I was more angry at my mother than I was at my father because she failed to protect me. I felt like she was the one who had always done things for me. She was maternal. And so to be suffering this extreme pain and her not protect me, there was a lot of anger projected towards her. My parents did divorce when I was 12. But from the time that the abuse started, from the age of eight to the age of 12, I was extremely angry towards my mother, and she felt it. And I think that's one of the reasons why she went off and kind of did her own thing. She eventually remarried and moved. Um, one of the reasons I didn't lash out at my mother was because she just simply wasn't present. Would you have, you think? I don't know if I would have or not. Um, you know, had she been there that night, I can't say what would have happened. I know that later on when I was in jail and my sister and I were both, my sister was, had been arrested too, and my sister and I had, were both um, visiting her on the other side of the table. When my mother turned to me and said, look what you've done, how could you do this? I immediately lunged towards her. And the only reason that we didn't have a physical altercation was because somebody literally picked me up and carried me out of the room. How are you doing with her now? Now we have a, we have a decent relationship. It's been extremely difficult, um, but lots of therapy. Overcoming my anger towards my mother has been extremely difficult, but it's been just by sitting down and listening to her side and understanding what she was going through at the time and just realizing that my mother wasn't mentally strong enough to be able to accept what the truth of what I was going through. She didn't know how to handle it, so she ran. She was able to minimize and to deny what she saw and what she felt, and it was a mentally protective, um, she mentally protected herself and while at times I still have, I still have anger that rises to the surface because I was her daughter and she should have protected me. But my mother had been horrifically abused herself and she did the best she could at the time. I know once my mother left my father, she had a string of boyfriends, string of boyfriends. And one of them said something extremely untoward towards me. And I knew that going to live with them, I was gonna be put in a, maybe even in a worse situation than a, what I already was. People didn't understand why I went to live with my father instead of my mother. Because my mother just subjected us to so many different men. And even though they might not have done anything, I kept expecting it. I kept waiting for it. I was always on edge. I could never be comfortable in my own home. I expected the next person to be just like the person before her. I think my mother wanted to be loved so much. She had this desire to be loved that I think that desire to be loved overruled her common sense, her better judgment, and her protectiveness for her daughters. Here's some things that I know, all right? Know that, know that you're hurt by your mom. One, you kicked out of the house. I know that hurts you a lot. I know it made you angry. Because you and your mom were close. You had plans to leave, right? You guys were gonna get out of town, start a new life. Now your mom wants you out of the house. If I was in your shoes, I would be really hurt and really angry.
and I know that your stepdad wasn't the nicest person. I know that. As a matter of fact, I talked to him once. And I could see how somebody might I could see how somebody might say the things that you've said about him. I don't think that, I don't think that you meant, I don't think that you meant to kill your mom. But it happened. But I think you were angry at Thomas. Because he wasn't a nice person. He didn't treat your mom well. He abused her. He abused the girls. And you weren't going to leave them there with him. I can tell you right now, I can understand that. From everything you've told me here, I can understand that. I can see how the, I can see how this could play out. It makes sense to me. Your your life is fucked up. What teenage girl doesn't wish she's going to run off with some magical knight and that she's going to live happily ever after like that princess in the fairy tale? Those daydreams are what get us through the nightmares of what we're living through, of reality. And I always tell people, you can't make sense of the nonsensical. And what children live through when they live in an abusive home is nonsensical. It doesn't make sense to the average normal person because you just don't know how you would react or how you would be if this had happened to you. You know, my greatest moments, people would say, oh, well, you look so normal because I got to be happy when I was away from it, when I was out, when I was around friends. I got to pretend that I was just like everybody else. And those few minutes of normalcy, or those minutes when my dad would smile at me and say, hey kiddo, how you doing? Would get me through the nightmares that I lived through. I know the pain of living through abuse. I know that it's something that, you know, you might be able to escape when you're 18 or 17 and you can get away, but you know what? The little ones, they can't get away. They cannot get away, they're trapped. They're trapped for another 17 years. You escaping is not going to help anybody else. Is that why you needed to put everybody at peace in your own way? I can understand that if that's it. I, I, don't, I don't know what the answer is. But sometimes what sounds like a good idea, maybe later isn't. And sometimes people feel that they have no choice. Sometimes they feel that this is the only way out because we've tried other things. We've tried to save money to get away. You know, they always fight and then they make up. You know, there's always that, that hope and then it's crushed when they get back together. And your mom was living a, a cycle that she couldn't get out of. You have no one you can talk to, and nobody's going to understand you. We were isolated. We didn't have friends. My father had a few friends who we didn't really interact with. We didn't have barbecues and socials and being around friends. I couldn't, I couldn't find anyone that, um, that could have stepped in like that. I tried going to the school and talking to the guidance counselor and 
telling her what I was going through. Um, but then nothing changed, nothing happened. I told a babysitter when I was 12, still nothing changed, nothing happened. My grandmother, his mother, while she was alive, would tell him to stop drinking. He would promise to change. He would continually promise that he was gonna stop drinking, but he just never did. I did tell the babysitter and I told the guidance counselor that he, that I, he was raping me. I didn't tell the guidance counselor who it was. I said it was someone in our house which the only people in our house were my sister and my father. Um, but the babysitter, I did tell her specifically, and she told my mother. Um, we didn't use strong enough words. We used the words, he hurt me. And so my mother, wasn't, my mother was able to wrap that kind of in denial and just make it mean that he had spanked me or hurt me. She minimized it. If we don't use the correct words, people minimize what it is what we go through for them to be able to handle it. And a lot of times as a victim, you don't want to see that abject horror on their face. It's extremely shameful. Eventually you ran into the Schulte guy who was, who was on your side. Do you wish you would have gone to Schulte before you pulled the trigger? I wish I would have known people like Schulte existed because you, I had the abuser telling me, nobody's ever going to believe you. They're not gonna believe you. And I had done things. I had shoplifted when I was a teenager. I smoked some pot. Um, and my dad would just say, they'll believe me, never you. Look at you, you're nothing. Everything you are is for me. To me, it was extremely brave of me to tell the people I did tell. And I paid dearly, dearly for that. So every time I would put my little toe in the water trying to get help and it just wasn't there, it just made me withdraw more and more. Um, had my, had I went and told, there would have been an investigation, most likely, and my dad would have came out on top of it, but what would have happened to me in that? And part of it, too, was, you know, my dad would tell me that no one would believe me, um, that they would take me away and put me somewhere worse, and he'd tell me horror stories about foster care and or if I went to juvenile, how I'd be raped repeatedly by other offenders or other guards. Um, sometimes it almost seems better to stay with what you know because you're afraid of the unknown. And you know that you can somewhat handle this and you're too scared to figure out if you can handle what you don't know. We don't make it safe for children to tell. We don't put it out there. Hey, if you're going through something, call someone, tell someone, you know, find your nearest policeman. We don't. So all we hear is the abuser's voice in our head. If you tell this is gonna happen and this is gonna happen and this is gonna happen. And I think we need to educate our children that they don't have to live this way, that there is help out there, that there are programs out there. They're out there, but how does a kid find them? I think the schools, the schools are in a very tough position because how do you educate a child without upsetting a parent? How do you let a child know that, how, how do you educate a child? It's extremely difficult. I think part of it is just letting them know that pain from someone is not normal and that the school is there to help them any way possible. I remember the first time I saw a PSA, a public service announcement, about um, sexual abuse. It was John Walsh, and um, I cried because I had never seen that as a child growing up. I didn't know that the help was there, that it existed. You hear about hotlines, but you think, well, they don't really help. For kids, that's not tangible. They don't see other kids being helped. They just have that abuser's voice saying it's going to be worse and they won't believe you. Schools, anybody who works for a school has a duty to report. So if they're told anything, then they automatically have to report. And that was one of the things in my case. My guidance counselor had a duty to report and didn't. There was also a fourth grade teacher who really thought something was going on with me because she could see it. And that was the time when the abuse became much worse. And um, she spoke to my mother. And my mother assured her nothing was wrong, everything was okay. And had that intervention happened at fourth grade, my life could have been so much different. 
you know, as adults, we get gut feelings and we have instincts and we know and just a few questions or just reporting it to someone else might make a difference in that life of a child. saying your life is perfect, but let's deal with what we have and make it work. You're still a kid. I know you feel grown up, but you're still a kid. The things that happen to you when you're a kid, it's not your fault. Right now, I guarantee you, you're safe. Okay, nothing bad, no bad shit's gonna happen. Okay, you've, you've lived some nightmare in your life, so have I. Yours might be worse than mine, but I guarantee you that that part is over. It's a new beginning. They keep turning their lights off But Julie knows a party at some actor's west side loft Supplies are endless in the evening By the morning they'll be gone When everything is lonely I can be my own best friend Coffee and the paper have my own conversations With the sidewalk and the pigeons and my window reflection The mask I polish in the evening by the morning looks like shit heavy heart I can feel it when we kiss so many men stronger than me have thrown their backs up trying to lift it but me I'm not a gamble you can count on me to split the love I saw you in the evening by the morning 
morning won't exist You're looking skinny like a model With your eyes all painted black You just keep going to the bathroom Always say you'll be right back It takes one to know one kid I think you got it bad But what's so easy in the evening By the morning such a drag I got a flask inside my pocket We can share it on the train If you promise to stay conscious, I would try and do the same. Well, we might die from medication, but we sure killed all the pain. But what was normal in the evening by the morning seems insane. And I'm not sure what the trouble was that started all of this the reasons all have run away but the feeling never did it's not something I would recommend but it is one way to live What is simple in the moonlight by the morning never is It was so simple in the moonlight, now it's so complicated It was so simple in the moonlight, so simple in the moonlight, so simple in the moonlight My name is Jean Hudkavich. I'm a teacher paraprofessional with the school district of Rhinelander. And I also work with incarcerated students at the um, jail. Well, when she became incarcerated, I started um, tutoring her and working with her at the jail to complete her courses to be able to graduate. We've been working on a lot of classes. We've um, worked on completing all the required courses for graduation as, as well as electives. Right now, she's working on intermediate writing course and advanced art topics, with just a couple of elective classes. She's met all her graduation requirements. I meet with her twice a week for about an hour. I never get any pushback from Ashley. She's, she's always just very happy to work on her schoolwork. She loves school. She loves education. She wants to do further education. Her demeanor with me is she's just always really kind and compassionate and ready to work. She's just uh, she's prepared, she's calm. She's very, very self-directed. She's a very diligent student. She um, is well prepared. She prepares quality work. I don't have to go back and ever ask her to redo anything. Um, towards the beginning, it appeared to me she was r rather timid, kind of afraid of what to say and what to do, and, you know, just didn't know where her life was going. I think over the past year, she has become more relaxed and more calm and um, more willing to talk, more open. With her art projects right now, it's just... A, like a general idea of what she needs to do, but what she actually draws is her, her own choosing. Have you noticed any trends in the types of things that she chooses to draw or write about? Um, I've just noticed that her initial drawings were a lot of black and white, and she's usually not more color now, a lot brighter, happier kind of. So right now, in intermediate writing, she has an A- minus in her class, and her advanced art topic, she's got an A. She is, um, has also um, 
taken her ACT tests over this winter and did very well for somebody that really had to educate herself most of the time, except for when I was there to help tutor her. She has um, completed all her requirements for graduation, and on June 9th, we are going to present her with her high school diploma. She will be the first one in her family to graduate. I just hope that she can continue with her education. I know that she loves gardening and being outside. I hope she has those opportunities, and she wants to become a writer. And I hope she has the opportunity to continue her education and maybe get a college diploma and go on to be a, a writer. I think that in many ways I needed prison. And I needed, I needed that time away from the outside influences to help me become comfortable in my own skin, to help me understand what had happened, to help me find forgiveness, both for my father, my mother, and myself. And it also helps take away from the detractors for the people who say, oh no, she should, she should spend the rest of her life in prison. What I did like about prison, prison was not a great place by any stretch of the imagination, but no matter where you are is where you are. You can make a difference and even being incarcerated, I did. Now, had I been free, I probably would have, I probably wouldn't have excelled. Even today, I wouldn't have excelled because I would have found escape mechanisms through drugs or alcohol or relationships to where being within four white walls, I had to become comfortable with who I was, what I had been through and what I had done. Whatever I choose to do, I'm free of my past. It'll always be a part of me, but I've already paid. Good things can be accomplished in a prison setting because prison is whatever you make of it, just like life anywhere else. It can be a horrible experience, horrible experience, especially when you're young, because when you go in, there's a lot of game and there's a lot of people who are horrible there and want to take advantage of you and use you and use people. Um, but if you stay away from them, involve yourself in positive things, seek out positive people, it can be a positive experience. I had taken some college classes piecemeal while I was incarcerated until they had pulled the Pell Grants for prisoners. You can no longer receive an education while you're incarcerated, which in my opinion is extremely detrimental to society. So I came home and I started working on my college degree, Small, couple classes here, couple classes there. Um, wound up transferring to a four-year year university. I got my bachelor's of science in psychology and I graduated magna cum laude. And um, then I applied, took the LSAT and applied to law school. And now I'm in my, I'm about ready to finish my second year of law school. I have no idea what I'll do with my law degree. I hope that the state licenses me. Um, we're getting ready to go before the board for that. Got to pass that character and fitness hump. Um, but if not, I just hope that I can be an advocate for children who find themselves in a situation like I was and for other juveniles um, who find themselves on the other side of a jail cell. One of the things that I discovered while I was incarcerated was that I'm not unique. There are multiple people who have suffered abuse like I have. And the one thing that we all have in common is that we all feel alone. You will have moments of weakness during incarceration. And a lot of my success in the free world, I attribute that I don't just do for me. I do for those who can't. And so it is my hope that people can see me and what I do with my life and the positive path that I'm on and know that every child, no matter how horrific of a crime they commit, has the ability to become something better, that they're more than their last worst act, that they have the ability to maybe help change our world. I think 40 years is too much. And I think eight years might not be quite enough. Um, I think at least 10 years, at least 10 years. Where do you come up with that number? Because, well, you get, 
I think a decade would give her something to hold on to. And when she feels that guilt and she feels that shame, like me, she'll know. She served time. She's done time. And in ways that'll help find her a path towards forgiveness. Why not more for retribution? Well, because there comes a point where she'll no longer be an asset to society. Like me, I was released when I was 36 years old, and that's enabled me to go down a very positive path. Had I been, right now I'm 43, had I just started doing the things I am now at 43, I wouldn't have had the energy, wouldn't have had the motivation. Um, I would have felt like my life was pretty much over. My father had extended family that one of the reasons why I think I got such a harsh sentence was because they wanted me to have life without parole. They didn't want sentence negotiations, and they were the next of kin. Um, and it was so hard for me because these people were my family too. And they never even once asked me, Stacy, did this happen? Stacy, can you explain this? You know, they wanted me to spend the rest of my life in a cage, segregated from society, no hopes, no dreams, never to be loved. And I entered when I was a child. And I think that every child, no matter what they've done, has the ability to change and to become something better. And so I think that asking the extended family, what would you want for your child is appropriate. It's easy to follow the law. It's hard to follow your conscience. I was lucky that my judge, while he followed the law, also followed his conscience. I think that his sentence recommendation went a long way in my clemency consideration. So I would hope that judges, even when they're making that sentence determination, that they keep in mind that this is still a person who has the ability to become something more than what they are in that courtroom right then. We love you very much and we will try to come see you if we can and we miss you. I love you Ashley. Um, I miss you. We all miss you. I love you, Ashley, and I miss you a lot. I wish I could see you and you could meet my baby. I would tell Ashley to keep her chin up and I would tell her that to remember that I love her. And above all else, I will be praying for her and that God loves her more than anything. You are more than what has happened, and you have the ability to become anything that you want to be. And don't ever fall into despair and think that this is it, because you never know, never know when your life will change and how it'll change. It's hard to do while you're surrounded by four wa white walls to not fall into self-pity to not fall into anger or to bitterness, but you have the opportunity to figure out who you want to be. Seek out the positive. Seek out the positive and just know tomorrow can be better. <laughs>